Welcome to the place where we gain knowledge through the lens of creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Artful Science. Thanks again for joining me here on Artful Science. Today's show is JWST, looking back to understand our future. And I'm gonna explain that in just a second. And our guest is Maggie Massetti, who serves as social media lead and website manager for the James Webb Space Telescope mission at NASA. Maggie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, so it's so great that you're here. And of course, JWST stands for the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, so I think, first of all, let's just, you know, get some context of, of all of this. And I always like to know when things are named after people, who was who James Webb? And it seems like he's pretty important to NASA. Sure. So um, just as an intro to the mission itself, James Webb Space Telescope is really a successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. A lot of times you'll see online that it, we're replacing Hubble, but we're not. We're really a successor to the science that Hubble uh, discovered and Hubble will keep discovering because um, Hubble is primarily optical light with a little bit of infrared and, and a little bit of ultraviolet and Webb is mostly infrared. So they're very compatible and they see slightly different things. So going forward, we have you know 30 years of Hubble data in the archive, plus it's still up there making observations and scientists will be able to use both the data from Webb, Hubble and other telescopes as well to get a broader picture of the universe. So Webb was actually named after James Webb, obviously. <laughs> he was a uh, Apollo era administrator of NASA. It's a little bit rare for a mission to be named after an administrator, but essentially he was the one that thought early NASA should have a science research pro program. Got you. Awesome. Awesome. And it's interesting because you know, I've seen in these, you know, giant institutions um, like NASA that it's, it's amazing because individuals can end up having really such an impact. And especially even after their time of leadership, we see the ripple effects of those. And so I always love that, just learning about that, that kind of leadership aspect of, of people and how that forwards things and especially forwards science. So you mentioned kind of just some of these things that are different, but you, you went through that pretty quickly about lenses and stuff. So kind of taking from an arts perspective, um, uh, what would you say kind of most defines how JWST is, is, is different? How is it gonna kind of maybe redefine what we can see out there versus say Hubble, as you mentioned, which of course many of us know about? Sure. So. Um... The reason they decided they needed Webb is that in astronomy, every 10 years, there's something called a decadal survey. And they look at, you know, what are the big questions that we want answered next? And obviously Hubble is so powerful and it created new questions for us to answer. So there are new questions. So one of the things that we've never really investigated is in the early universe, when did the stars, the first stars and galaxies form? We've seen, we've seen, about a couple hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, missions like COBE that looked at the early microwave background in the universe. But somewhere around 100 million to 250 million years after the Big Bang, stars and galaxies started forming. We don't know exactly when, we don't know how, but we've never been able to see that period of the universe's history. And that's because thanks to um, the expansion of the universe, the light from those things are red shifted slightly. So an optical telescope like Hubble, A is not powerful enough to see back that far, but it's also not able to see the infrared light from those first stars and galaxies. So they decided a giant infrared space telescope will help us see those first stars and galaxies forming in the early universe. So that was probably like the earliest primary reason to build Webb, though um, interestingly, in, in the years of development of this telescope, exoplanets became a thing. Planets orbiting around stars that are not our sun. Um, it's a relatively new field of astronomy, and they realized that the instruments on Webb would allow them to explore the atmospheres of some of these exoplanets, which is really exciting. So uh, there are missions like Kepler and TESS that are sort of planet finders but we'll actually be able to really zero in on a specific um, planet candidate and we can actually analyze the atmosphere and tell what the atmosphere is made of. 
And so let me just get this straight, because that seems just so fascinating that, that JWST will be able to look at a specific exoplanet rock ro rolling around a distant star and be able to study the atmosphere of that planet. Yes, just from that little dot of light. It's so powerful that that dot will tell it what it needs to know so it can analyze it and see what molecules or elements are present. The, the goal, obviously, it would be amazing to find you know, a planet that had an atmosphere similar to Earth's. Of course, absolutely. And do you think this is a little bit of a side note that if we say determined there was that type of atmosphere, do we have kind of a scientific basis to then infer the presence of water on that planet as well, if we know its atmosphere? Uh, water, I'm not an exoplanet scientist, so I can't answer precisely, but I mean, they can definitely determine uh, water in the atmosphere, whether that would translate to water in the ground. It's not really my field of expertise. Right. No, it's just truly fascinating. And so kind of going separate from the exoplanets as it's looking out, right, in this idea that basically Hubble could not look out as far and also, right, can't look out as fast because the universe is expanding so fast that the things that are distant are getting more distant so quickly, right, that we kind of can't potentially see them. Will, what is the ultimate distance or how far will we be able to see with JWST? Uh, over 13.5 uh, billion years. Yeah, wow. so, um, you know, and just to... Yeah, and give us some context of what sure. that means. <laughs> so a lot of people uh, find the concept confusing of like looking looking back. Uh, you know, think about the sun is, the, it takes eight minutes for light to travel from the sun to us. So we are actually, when you look up in the sky, you were seeing the sun as it was eight minutes ago. And if you look at the light from the nearest star to us, that light left four plus years ago. So, you know, as you look at things that are further and further away from us, that light takes a lot of time to travel to us. So we're seeing them as they were. So that's the basic idea is that those um, earliest stars and galaxies, the ones that are really far away from us, we are only now getting their light when it left them over 13 and a half billion years ago. So that's how it's possible to sort of look back in time by looking at things that are far away from us. Yeah, it's just, it's truly amazing science. And ultimately, you know, when we have this information, is there the, you know, there are people either, you know, in, in political positions or, you know, some artists who are like, okay, well, this is kind of fascinating, but how will it affect my daily life kind of thing, right? So say we are able to really achieve and, and we are able to see and understand these things from over 13 billion years ago. Is there a sense of, of that benefit, how that translates for us as society? How will we benefit from this information? Sure. So um, I think even closer to home is that when we develop these NASA missions, technology spinoffs results. So, you know, I, I often see comments about like, well, how does Mars affect me? But it's like, but if they can learn more about growing crops more effectively at home because of the research they did, then, then that benefits us. For, for Webb specifically, um, they actually uh, have a new technique for laser eye surgery that resulted from some of the testing that was done uh, to develop the, the mirrors for Webb. So there already have been benefits here on earth, which is great. Webb, besides seeing the very furthest things that furthest bright objects that formed in the early universe, we can actually see things closer by too. We'll study our own solar system as well. We can't actually look towards the sun. Uh, we have this giant tennis court sized sun shield that protects the very sensitive mirrors and instruments. Uh, as you imagine, infrared light is heat. So we have to keep anything that's hot away from the mirror so it can detect those faint heat signals from far away. So um, it has to be oriented at all times with that sun shield blocking the light and heat of earth, sun and moon, but it can see outwards. So we'll be able to look at the solar system from Mars on out. We can see asteroids, other small objects in the solar system. So we'll be able to do follow on work to Cassini and New Horizons and you know, understanding planets in our solar system, planets in other solar systems will help us learn more about our planet. Awesome. So this really is vital information and is amazing. Who will have access to it? Will it just kind of be the scientists running it or who will be able to see and, and learn from and you know, kind of experiment with this imagery? I mean, really everyone, most space telescopes are fairly egalitarian in that they have um, 
times where you can sit, submit proposals. So you can say, I want to look at X, I want Y amount of time, and you write up your justification and you submit it. And then they have um, peer reviews where they'll go through blind, usually these, uh, these submissions, and they decide what's worthy of time on whatever space telescope people are applying for. So, you know, in, in theory, anyone could get time on it. it. It helps if you know what you're doing, because obviously time is at a premium for these telescopes, but Hubble works this way. Webb will also work this way. They actually already had the um, proposal submissions. So the first round of observations are already planned um, and about six months after launch, because we have to cool down to our operating temperature and we have to calibrate the mirrors and instruments. Uh, we'll start routine science operations and all that is already lined up. And then, you know, the the results of some of those things will be announced just like you see Hubble images on you know NASA's social media and websites it'll be the same for web and then all that data is actually stored in an archive so at Space Telescope Science Institute there's a whole archive of Hubble data so if you're a scientist who's studying a particular exoplanet or you know whatever object it is you can actually go into the archive of Hubble data and look for observations past observations of your object and download data that might be useful to you in your current research. So web data will also be stored in the same archive that the Hubble data is stored in. So anyone really can access that data. You'd have to know, you know how to use the software to analyze the data, but in theory, anyone can access it. It's, yeah, no, it's really amazing. And I think in that, allows us to kind of have this collective moving forward of, of developing our knowledge rather than just these separate individual pockets. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so you referenced six months after launch, when is it proposed to launch? So uh, we are actually still working with ESA and Ariane Spass on our launch date. Um, it's an international mission. So our partners are the Canadian Space Agency and the European Space Agency. And part of ESA's contribution to the mission is the launch site and the launch vehicle. So because it's there, they're you know part of the mission they are the ones who determine that there's one more arian 5 launch before ours so that needs to be scheduled and then they'll schedule us nasa has been holding to an october 31st launch readiness date which means that we'll be let, ready to launch no sooner than october 31st um and so i think you'll probably hear soon from isa on on an actual launch date but that's sort of their purview so, so exciting. So unfortunately, we're just about out of time, but I always like to ask of all my guests, you know, they're steeped in all of this work and in science. Um, and here we are at this intersection of the arts and sciences. Do you have any either artistic practice you do yourself or interests that you have? Yeah, so I'm a musician, mostly. Um, my mother is watercolors, but I've, music is really where my artistic talent has, has lay. Um, I'm in a band called Naked Singularity, which is an astronomy reference with some friends from work. Of uh, course, awesome. That's so cool. Years, but, <laughs> but yeah, so and you can see behind me some art uh, that artists contributed to an event we did a couple years ago. Um, so I'm a really big believer in art plus science. That is truly, truly awesome. So excited to hear that. Maggie Massetti, thank you for helping us gain knowledge through the lens of creativity here on Artful Science.